Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions – Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love Group and is part of the Education and Love series. In the introduction presentation, Jesus introduces the Education and Love Assistance Groups by talking about the source of our education and love. God's definition of love in comparison to humankind's definition and provides an overview of the coming week. Recorded on the 20th of February 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. All right, well, I think we'll make a start. Are we all okay recording wise? Everything is good? Thanks. All right. Well, I suppose the question is uh, what's going to happen in these education in love assistance groups. So what I'd like to do first with you is to just ba give you a brief summary of the eight different groups that we will be running. And I said yesterday that it was 180 hours, but it's actually 240 hours of material that will be presented over a period of two and a half years. The reason why we uh, gave it two and a half years is we, we thought that you might need a bit of time in between to, to apply a lot of the material, and, and there is a lot of material, so it's going to take a, a fair bit of effort to apply if you're really going to apply it. So we, we decided that the best course of action was, uh, bearing in mind that many of you have jobs and so forth, the best course of action was to only do three groups a year, and, uh, and, and as it worked out, there were more people than would fit in one group, so we finished up doing two groups of three groups a year, and, uh, and as I said yesterday, you guys have already paid for the first three groups. We've already paid the venue, actually, for the first three groups here, which is wonderful. Now, what are the subjects that we're going to cover? Well, the very first subject this, of this group is developing the will to love. Dewe and, and let's put it more personally, it's developing my will. So, so that's our first... And we'll go through in a little bit what uh, we're going to cover in this particular mm. group and, and what kind of subject matters we'll be discussing in this group. Now you've already seen, many of you have printed out the outline so you have a good idea of what we're going to cover but I just wanted to give you a bit of a brief summary of what we're going to cover. The next group is about yourself developing my loving self. And there we focus more on the material about the three selves, you know, the, the facade self and the hurt self and the real self. And we spend a lot more time actually on the real self uh, in those particular discussions so that you can learn to identify what is really you and what the bits of you eventually you won't even really, uh, it will be completely discarded and you won't even recognize that you even had them. And so that, uh, that's a very important groundwork, I suppose you could say, for understanding also the principles of facade and addiction, which are the primary reasons why the majority of people don't learn about love. So because we're locked in the world's definition of love, and as we'll talk about this morning, the world's definition of love is severely distorted. So that's the, the next group. And then the group after that is about developing some understanding of God's laws of love. Now, originally we decided that we would put this uh, further down in the presentation, but then we realised that many of us don't really have a good grasp of God's laws, the gen the, of the general laws, that govern particularly the human soul. So while you may have some kind of understanding of some of the physical laws, um, the soul-based laws are the laws that we'll be focusing on there. And we're going to be looking at laws that you've heard of before, like the law of attraction, the law of cause and effect, and those kind of laws. But we also be looking far more in far more depth on the laws of forgiveness and repentance, which are very important laws relating to divine love. And, and we want to, during those sessions, come to understand them so that we have a grasp, even just an intellectual grasp, of what they are. 
Then we come to focus on another area which is very important to your growth in love. Which is understanding the cause of sin. Sin meaning missing the mark of perfection or missing the mark of love. So what we want to do is start to understand the causes of it. What, what are the reasons why we get impelled? You know, we have these internal emotional feelings that impel us to do things that are out of harmony with love, even though intellectually we know, oh, I'm, I'm doing something out of harmony with love right now even, and, and yet we still feel impelled to do it. And what we want to do is understand in a lot more depth why that happens, what's going on inside of us, that causes us to, causes us to think and, and 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 also feel that we can act in harmony with sin, act out out of harmony with love, and yet and yet still get away with that. And so, what we need to do is understand the cause of sin. We also begin to see the relationship between God's laws of love and sin, and and how God's laws of love are always trying to correct the sin, trying to readjust us back into a state of love. And so we start to see this relationship there that, that you'll hopefully by that stage begin to understand. And then we want to focus on you on removing. How to, how, what is the quickest ways to remove the cause of sin? So obviously in, in that particular discussion, we're now focusing on some practical things, incorporating these things we've already learned into, into a process where we can begin to understand what's the most rapid way to get from, from ourselves these, you know, these hidden passions and desires that are out of harmony with love that cause us to sin, how to remove them from ourselves and what is the most, the, the most rapid way to do that. So the faster you can do that, the better your life's going to be, right? So that, that there's a direct relationship between the happiness in your life, as you'll learn in this group, and, and the sin that remains within you and you acting upon it. And so removing the cause of sin becomes a key part of your happiness and it also becomes a key part of your development in love. The more sin that is removed from you, the less you will be impelled naturally to do unloving things. And therefore, the more loving you will automatically become. And so it's very, very important that we understand how to remove the cause of sin. What is the most effective way of doing that? And we're going to discuss in detail with you those particular issues in that particular group. So now we're talking, this one's this group. This one is the group that, that begins in May. This one is the group that begins in November. So now we're talking like February, March next year. And then we're talking about May, June next year, by the time we're getting to this point. Then we will focus our attention on engaging God's laws of love. So up until this point, we've learned about God's laws of love. We now understand the cause of sin. We now understand how to remove the cause of sin. But, but we also need to understand that actually the majority of God's laws have nothing to do with correcting you. The majority of God's laws have everything to do with providing you with happiness. All right? So this is something that most people don't realize is that, that there are so many laws in the universe that God has, has particularly created in order, to, in order to help you become happier. They're not to correct you. right? So there's laws like the law of compensation, which is a law that's there to correct you. Right? But then there's a whole group of laws that are there to, to help you grow and inspire you and help you, help you enjoy and have a happy life, most of which we never engage. And if I could uh, give you a bit of an example of that, it's like with the law of gravity, for many centuries, many millennia in fact, most people didn't know about the law of aerodynamics. Right? And so they engaged the law of gravity. Now the law of gravity is a law that we're all engaging automatically. It's there con constantly. And as a, re as a result, it keeps us on the planet. So it, it, it allows us to have a life. Because if, uh, if there was no gravity, we'd be flying off out in space. The, the world's turning around at, oh, I think it's something like 1,600 kilometres an hour. And, and, and at that speed, we'd be flying off out into space if there was no gravity. 
right? So it doesn't help you have a life on earth, gravity does. But aside from that, everybody has to engage that law because we didn't know any other law. And then the law of aerodynamics came along and people started to discover that. Now we can enjoy flight. Now many of you, that, that has enhanced your life. In the first century, it was very, very difficult to travel long distances. You, you, you would never, you, to consider travelling, say, from, from Israel to, to uh, Britain, which wasn't known as that, of course, at the time, but to consider that travel, you, you would have to put away years of your life to do that. And now you can put away, what, a couple of days and you're there. And, uh, and the law of aerodynamics allows that enjoyment of your life. So the law of aerodynamics directly creates joy in your life, you see. The law of gravity allows you to be constrained to the earth, so therefore enjoy the confines of the earth, otherwise you'd be flying out into space and not being able to breathe anymore and dying very rapidly. Um, but, but it doesn't allow you to enjoy other things like instant travel, travel to other countries very easily. Right? Whereas the law of aerodynamics does. The higher the law, the more joy is involved once you discover the operation of the law. Right? And this is something that we need to understand. That Many of us are just feeling the grinding of God's law of compensation, for example, or the law of attraction, and we're thinking, oh, if all of God's laws are like this, I don't know how I'm ever going to cope, right? And, and yet there are a whole slew of laws. In fact, there are many laws, even physical ones, that humankind has yet to even discover which would enable humankind to enjoy a much happier life here on Earth. Right? And what we need to do is learn how to engage even the basics of God's laws in order to learn about love. So after that, of course, we, we want to learn about how to receive love from God. So this is a very key part of our presentation, understanding how to receive love from God. We will start in this process today, actually, in terms of this discussion about this particular issue. The reason why is that without love from God, as you will find out, you will not be able to grow. And you will not, when I say you will not be able to grow, you will not ever become at one with God. You will never be able to become at one with your soulmate. You will never be able to do a lot of things unless you do this, receive love from God. And I, we'll talk about why that is the case in a minute. And then um, we also want to focus on to God. You see, a, a relationship is where love is given and received, is it not? So if you're going to engage a relationship with God, it's not just going to be about you receiving all of God's love and then nothing else happening. It's going to be about this, this constant growth in the giving and reception of love. Your love to God and God's love to you. Now, of course, the more of God's love you have in you, the more you can also share that love with others. But in the end, having this relationship with God re requires a, a circular system, if you like, between yourself and God. And so they're the main topics that we're going to discuss with you in this what I'd classify as an introductory course about love. All right. Now, is there any questions about that, just in terms of the generalities? No? Okay, so let's focus now our attention on the very first topic. The topic of developing my will to love. We're going to focus your attention uh, over the next three days, uh, six days, on three primary areas of this, right? So the first area is that we want to help, help you come to engage the concept of your will and, and ask yourself, how do you really feel about love? What's really going on inside of you 
with regard to your true feelings and emotions about love and change. So we want you in the next two days to examine your true feelings about love and change. Because if you don't know your true feelings, you're going to perhaps have a facade or you're going to think that you know things you don't know or you're going to think you're already doing things that you're not actually doing and you're going to not have a firm basis to make any choices and decisions about how to use your will. So you need to know where you stand right now. It needs to be an honest and accurate reflection of where you are right now. Right? The next two days after that, so the first two days are, are examining the, this, how you truly feel. The next two days after that, we're going to look at, look at four main topics and they're all revolving our fear and resistance to truth. And we're going to be examining our lack of faith, our fear of emotion, our fear of action and our resistance to truth. Right? And in, the, in that particular section, we're going to try to focus your attention on, on examining again yourself and your true feelings in regard to these particular things. And rather than falsifying the feelings to yourself, which, by the way, is the most damaging thing you can do. If you're telling lies to yourself, not a single, not, no other person can help you. We need to stop telling lies to ourselves and actually face God's truth about, different, uh, about these particular issues. And then the last section we want to focus your attention on uh, developing the, the aspect really of developing your will. Now the reason why we cover the, the other things first is because they are things that impede your will. They are the things that stop you from using your will. So a lack of faith stops you from using your will. A lack of desire for truth stops you from using your will in harmony with love. A, la a lack of desire to deal with your emotional condition stops you from using your will in harmony with love. A lack of desire to act stops you from using your will in harmony with love. So these are why, this is why we cover those things beforehand. But then in the last two days of, this particular session, of these sessions, we'll be focusing your attention on your will itself what it is and measuring its results looking at it honestly and measuring its results so we look at the relationship between pain and pleasure and your will right we want to see that pain and pleasure are both feedback mechanisms that tell you how you're using your will so we want to examine that we then want to focus on how you go about developing your will to actually love and what what are the rewards of doing that because a lot of times I notice that people just think, oh, it's all tomb and gloom, you know, it's all terrible. It's just an avoidance of pain that we're trying to have here. And it's not the case at all. What we're trying to do is to demonstrate to you the potential rewards that come, which have nothing to do with pain or the avoidance of it, by the way. And, uh, and those particular rewards that come will greatly benefit you in your life, not only now, but right the way through your ever everlasting future. So that's why it's very important to learn about your will. Remember that your will is the gift God has already given you. So God's love has, has, may not have already been received by you, but the aspect of being able to use your will is a gift that has already been given and you already have it whether you know how to use it or not. All right. So if you think about it, the w learning how to use your will is one of the most important things that you will ever do your entire life. Because all of the other things you choose to do will be based upon how you exercise your will. So learning about your will and how to use it are very, very important for your future. That make sense? So that's our focus with this particular conversation that we want to raise with you now. Now, when did these groups begin in terms of this information or knowledge? Well, for me, it goes back to when I was a child in the first century. And... We, uh, unbeknown to most people, we lived uh, until I was 12 years of age on the Nile, near the Nile River in Egypt. And 
I used to have a fair bit of flexibility. My mother, uh, uh, my father was a busy businessman, I suppose you could say nowadays. He had a building business that he was just establishing. My mother had all, besides having myself as a child, by the time I was three years of age, there were two more children also that she had. So I had a very large degree of flexibility in my life. Uh, I, I, my father was off working and my mother was busy with two other children and so I could pretty much wander where I wanted to wander, which, which I loved. And that meant that I spent a lot of my time wandering through the Nile Delta, which was, which was the area in which we lived, at the end of the Nile River where it was the widest, where it spreads out into that delta. And and in that process, I got to saw, see so many things that I was interested in. And, and in the process of being interested in those particular things, I found that every time I exercised a really passionate desire to know about something, within a day, usually, I found out the truth about that particular thing. And I was only two or three, well, at this stage, I was three, three and a half years old, four years old. And I realised that all I had to do is feel like I wanted to find out about something and the, usually the very next day I found out about it. And that, oh, I didn't know at the time, but, but I was being educated. I was being educated by, firstly, some spirits who were guiding me, the spirits that you've heard of from the Bible that oh, I didn't know at the time were my guides, but later I found out because I saw them and could talk to them. And so eventually I worked out who they were. But when I was four, I didn't know. I was, all I was doing was listening to them. And also there was this other sensation going on which I couldn't describe to anybody and which those spirits didn't know about either. And that was this sensation of feeling like I was constantly being parented, fa fathered or mothered, I suppose you could say. Not in an unloving manner, but rather in a very gentle way so that anything that I desired to know about, I, I, I would be informed of. And I became more and more sensitive to this over, over the years between four and five years of age. In the process of being sensitive about it, um, my father in particular became concerned about me because he, he was a man who um, believed that I was the coming Messiah of the, of the Jews and he believed that that Messiah would have to be a warrior, a, a person who would lead uh, the Israel nation into battle against the Roman oppressor and as a result he wanted to educate me a different way. So he decided that he wanted to educate me uh, in the ways of battle and so they sent me into a school when I was six years of age which was a school um, I've still got some feelings about it because it's a traumatic school for me but it was a school which Corney himself has been through. He had a, a lot worse than I did. But it was a school that basically educated you how to destroy people. And, and I found it very, very difficult being there. Um, I spent two years there. During that time, I observed the systematic destruction of a lot of young boys into becoming, in, you know, becoming warriors. But also, uh, there, were, there were women there who were used to, to clean and, and cook for these boys and so forth, who were actually sexually abused as well, and their children, their daughters were also sexually abused. So it was a very traumatic period of my life, of my education, I suppose you could call it. But it, it taught me uh, some very basic things about education. And you know what that is? That you cannot learn from a person who does not know. Right? You can't learn something from somebody who doesn't know. And then it caused me to consider this particular fact. And I noticed living in the Nile the Delta, obviously the river was the biggest river that I've ever seen in my life. The irony is in this life I lived on the Murray River. So, so I've had a very similar life till the age of 12. In fact, in this life I lived on the Murray River till I was 12 years of age. And in my first century life, I lived on the Nile River until I was 12 years of age. But in living there, I learned a lot of things about how things naturally work, what you would call the logic or the science behind things. And what I learned was this very basic principle. If you have water up here and you're down here, then you can get that water to flow to you. Right? But if, if the water is down up there and you're up here 
then you can't get the water to flow to you. Uh -huh. So what, what does that tell me about learning things? Well, what it told me about learning things was it's very much the same with education. You had to find somebody who is in a higher, better condition in order to grow from your current state. You had to do that in order to be educated. Now, when I looked around the world around me, I saw a whole world around me who were in different... Sorry about the... Uh, too many arms there. Um, right? All people in different conditions. Now, sometimes they would be in what I would classify as inspired or they had personal aspirations. Now, when I use those two terms, I use them very differently. Aspiration, I feel, comes from within oneself to access your desires and passions. The, 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 when you're inspired, it comes from another person, another being, and usually it's the spirit who inspires you to do things. Now, you can be inspired or have aspirations to do very, very negative things, which if we examine the people in the world today, many people do, right? And then you can also have aspirations or be inspired to do very many positive things, which people also do. So what I found was that there was a general play, if you like, between these aspirations and inspirations that cause people to either degrade in their condition or slightly rise their condition, but it was never permanent. In other words, I realised that if I was going to gain my education from the world, then the only result was going to be that I would end up being the same as the world. Now that came to me as a, as a re revelation when I was 10 years of age. And because I'd had such what you would classify by that stage, some of my education was quite traumatic. Other parts of my education, I, I was also enrolled in a rabbinical school as a, as a child. Uh, by my father, there, was a, there were temples, Jewish temples actually, in Egypt at the time because there were nearly a million Jews who lived in, the, in this location. And so they had rabbinical schools and I, I attended a rabbinical school during that particular phase of my life as well. And what I found was that many of the people who were teaching me did not know what I felt to be the, uh, the basic questions, the basic understanding of the basic questions. One of the most basic questions is, where did I come from? Another basic question is, who made all this? What, what made all this? How did this all come to be? None of these questions could be easily answered. And I realised that if I was going to get the answer to these questions, it was going to have to come from another source. <laughs> because the sources that were around me did not know. Right? Now, what I, why I'm saying this to you is, is that one of the things I came to see is that unless I could find a higher source of information, then my education was doomed. <laughs> That's how I felt. I, I had had enough education by this stage to be able to speak three languages, right? spoke Aramaic, Greek and Hebrew and I also had enough education by this stage to understand the, 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 what was called the Torah, the law of the Jews, along with the prophets, which were a whole lot of prophet, prophetic books which are now, many of them, contained in the Bible. And in addition to that, I had the same kind of education as Cornelius had, which with, re with regard to war, although not to his extent. He, he had a terrible education in that regard, beginning when he was five years of age, and, and he remained a warrior until his death, almost. Whereas that didn't happen for myself. But in the process of seeing all of these particular things, I realised that unless I could find a source of information that was far more reliable and also higher than the sources of information that were available to me at the time, then it was impossible for me to get to this point where I could actually progress and change and work beyond my current condition. So what would you do if you were at that stage and you understood that? You'd want to find some, somebody or something, wouldn't you, that could educate you with regard to that. 
I realized that the water will not flow higher than its source unless my source was high. And if you could think of water as life giving truth, um, unless the source of life giving truth was high, it was impossible for me to grow beyond the condition that I currently was. And that would mean that for the rest of my life, most of the questions that I had, f firmly fixed by this stage in my mind, would never be answered. And, and to me, that was unacceptable. You see, the difference between yourself and myself is for you, many, for many of you, and most of you, it's been acceptable. To remain in a state where you don't know. Right? But for me, I find it very, very difficult to do that. Right? I also came to see that accepting education from people who were in the same condition as myself was pointless. And therefore, engaging a process of... My father wanted me to engage a process of education in the martial arts as well as education in the law. Uh, his aspiration was to become uh, a, a member of the Sanhedrin of the Jews, which was the governing body of the Jews at the time. And eventually, he, at the time of my death, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. That was his underlying aspiration. And, and the main reason why he had that aspiration was that he felt that would assist me as his son to become the leader or the messiah of the Jews. Of course, his aspirations and mine were completely different. And by the time I was 10 years of age, we were already having quite detailed, de detailed discussions and, and on his part, quite angry responses to, to the discussions that we were having about what the messiah would actually do. Now, for, after I left this school, he, he tried to force me back to it, of course. Now, that meant, of course, receiving a lot of violence from my father until such a point in time that he gave up because he realised that I would not be shifted on the matter and I would not go back. So I, I had to learn, too, that if I was going to really engage this process of discovering what the truth was, becoming educated, that I would have to, at times, deal with quite a lot of opposition. And a lot of that opposition would come not only from my friends or my acquaintances, but also from my family. But how important is the answers? That's, that's what I kept coming back to. The answers to me were so important that, that I had to consider the fact that I might not have a family and yet still need to discover the answers to these particular questions that I had. Now, of course, all through this process, I didn't know it at the time, but I realise now, and I realised shortly, you know, in, afterwards in this time, that God was already educating me. Just like God's already attempting to educate you. Right. So uh, what does that tell me about my education in love? It tells me a number of things. It is pointless for me to engage in education in love from the world around me because the condition of the world around me is lower than where I would like to be with regard to how I express my love. So it's pointless trying to engage people to educate me who are uneducated themselves. And in the first century, I then coined the term, it's like the blind leading the blind. They both fall into the pit. And I didn't want to go along into the pit along with my teachers. <laughs> All right. so, so I learned that the only true source of real education has to be someone higher than myself. <coughs> And because of the sensitivity I had at the time to feeling somebody who I could not see, I recognised that that being was a being obviously higher than myself. And as long as I could learn to connect to that being and be educated by that being, then I had the chance to grow. And I had the chance to grow in love, which is what I wanted to do. But the greatest motivator for me at the time was not love, it was truth. I wanted to know the answers to some very, very basic questions that humanity has been asking for literally thousands or tens of thousands of years. That was the main motivator. 
Now, does anyone have any questions at that point? So, um, Nina, thank you. What was the determining factor that helped you decide that there was a being? It's, like, it, give it, like this is a critical question and a critical answer. The answer is because I could feel them. So it was a, an emotional feeling that I could feel made the being. that distinction. Yes. Okay. And then, then I realised, looking around me, a number of things. I realised that the majority of people could not feel this being. But they could feel many other things. So they, could, they, they were sensitive enough to know when somebody was talking about them behind their back, even when they hadn't heard them do so. Just like you can, right? right? They were sensitive enough to know the feelings that were going on between themselves and other people but they weren't open to this being giving them feelings. They had a lot of preconceived notions about this being that I could feel were not correct as well because the being told me they were not correct. Now that being I called God. In the first century, God had a name for us as Jews. It was Yahweh or Jehovah. So in the first century, that was the name of God. And and so I felt that Yahweh or Jehovah was this being who was educating me. Now, of course, I didn't know for certain at that point. I was just young in my inf infancy in this relationship between myself and this being. But this being was telling me everything that I needed to know. And it was informing me about things that nobody around me knew anything about. Right? So, so to me... The relationship with this being became critical. How do I develop this relationship with this being to enable myself to grow more in love? And that, that became my quest, my, my primary quest, in fact. Develop this relationship with this being and all the questions would be answered. And I, I came to realise some basic logical principles. One of these basic logical principles is if God does exist... God must love because humankind's love and God would have had to create the whole emotion of love in order for humankind's to love. So if God does exist, God loves and God would be perfected in love and God would already know everything about it. God would also know all truth. So it made sense to me that rather than experimenting as I did as a child with nature and everything as my primary focus, I needed to make the experiment my primary focus, my experiment with God. And then... All, these other, all this other knowledge would come. And, and initially it was a theory, I suppose you could call it. Right? A theory that I had to test, that I had to do things in order to put into practice to discover the truth about, which I eventually felt I did discover the truth about when I was around 18 years of age. And then it became a, even a higher focus in my life, if, that, if you could imagine that. And from the age of 18 to the age of 30, my one focus became what I felt was quite a certain condition, and that was the condition of becoming at one with this being. At one meaning having, the same, ha having no impediments to the flow of that love from this being and no impediments to the flow of truth from this being ever. Right? I realised that that was a potential condition Potential, because it was something that I hadn't, did not have at the time, but potentially I felt would happen. And in fact, I felt quite clear indications from this being that it was a potential possibility, depending upon my desire and the exercise of my will. Yep. Alan, thanks. And then if we go to Catherine... You had um, Yahweh and through uh, the ages, different groups of people have had a concept of God. So where did their concept of God come from? The their, Jews, for example. Yeah, well, the, the, their concepts of God were very much based around their concepts of a human parent. 
they, they had created in their own mind an anthropomorphic god, a, a god that resembles a human, that had wrath, that had anger, that had rage, that would punish and have resentment and so forth. And they, they spent much of their time interacting with these gods, which were often spirits who were resentful, and they spent most of their time trying to discover how to appease them. And that's what their common concept of God was at the time. And if you think about it, that common concept of God still remains. The majority of people who would call themselves a worshipper of one God believe in the God that, like that. So, so it has barely changed in the 2,000 years since, since my first time here on earth. And, and in fact, it has barely changed for tens of thousands of years before that time. Now, there are other concepts of, uh, that there, God does not exist at all, and they have been now becoming more popular. Right? And there's a whole reason for that too. Uh, many of those reasons are because we do not understand God. And the main reason why is because we continue to try to judge God based upon what we would do. And that's where we fall down. That's where we make huge mistakes. When I um, try and open my heart to God... It's, it's um, you know, I can kind of grind away at it. But if I start to think about God as, as an entity and, and how big and infinite and all that kind of stuff is, then I just freak out and I, I lose that. Connection. Yeah. Yes, because what, what happens there is that the soul, which I found out, I, by, the, by the time I was around, the, my, in my teenage years, I found out that the humankind, I could see, by this stage, I could see the spirit bodies of people. So I knew we had a physical body and a spirit body. But after a while, I came to see that we also had a soul because I, I realised that I could see the spirit bodies of children being incarnated into when parents conceived. And, and once that uh, occurred, I, I realised that at that point in time, that we also had something else. There had to be another thing I couldn't see, right? And that being our soul. And, and if you maintain a connection between, with your soul, with God, now you have the ability to receive anything from God. But if you start to think about it too, too much in your head, right, all of your human emotion that has been there from the moment you were conceived will start to rise. And, and some of those emotions of fear and terror and all sorts of traumas exist. And those particular emotions shut down the connection with God. And that's when I learned about emotion. I learned that emotion was the cause of the main thing that causes people to disconnect from God. And in fact, at the same time, I learnt that emotion was the main thing that caused people to sin. Right? And that's why we, when we trust and we have the emotional feelings, we can feel it, but as soon as we enter our head uh, 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 we, and we try to reason on the matter, uh, which, by the way, our brain is not capable of actually doing. It's only our soul's brain that has the capacity to understand God. It's not our physical brain. Our physical brain was never designed to have that capacity. And as a result, as soon as we enter that state of our head, we now can't understand God again. And we don't trust it, and we enter our emotional state, which is damaged, that causes us then to detune from God. Yeah. Catherine, I've just got to keep an eye on my time. Yep. <clears throat> I'm going to stop the back there. So <clears throat> we, as, we as children must have also been given that gift that God gave you. Yes. But we rejected it and didn't use our will to do what you did. No, your will was already been, has, had already been manipulated by your parents' emotions to not to reject it. So you can't blame yourself for that. It's, a, it's, a, what, it's what I came to understand and, and finished up terming in the first century, edemic sin. In other words, the sin that got carried down from generation to generation was this disconnection from God and the desire to reject any of this emotional connection with God. But that's another subject of its own. So I'd like to leave that subject you know, something for another day because I want to talk to you about a few things about this. 
You can see in my illustration I've given to you about the discoveries that I've made in my life in the first century that firstly my will had to be engaged in a positive way to understand a basic truth and that was that no amount of education from any single person in the world was going to get me to the point where I understood anything more than they understood. And that was a very critical time to, and a critical thing to understand. And I feel it's a critical thing for you to understand right now. No amount of you educating yourself in this world is going to get the answers that you want. Right? You've got to get them from a higher source. Right? And what I'm proposing is that source has to be more developed in love than you are. Now, of course, there are spirits and people potentially on earth that are more developed in love than you are, but finding them is very, very difficult, right? But God is there for everyone, so therefore God is available to all of you. God, God is the supreme development in love, therefore the highest source, and surely it would make sense to go to the highest source if you're going to have an education in love. So that is the first thing you need to realise. The highest source is is the source you need to approach if you are going to get educated in love. Now the second thing I'd like to say, and we've only got a few minutes down to say it, and that is that the difference between God's definition of love and yours are so vastly different as to be almost complete opposites. Now let's give you some proof about that. What does God do? in comparison to what humans think God should do? Well, it appears God doesn't do much for many people, isn't it? But let's look at it. Like, what, humans feel that God should feed the, feed the starving. Yes? Well, God doesn't do that. Why? There's got to be something that we, what we believe and what God believes is completely out of harmony with each other there. Humans believe God should stop humankind having wars. In fact, there's a whole teaching in the Christian faith that God is going to send Jesus, his son, to earth who's going to war, <laughs> to have the war to end all wars, right? To, to get rid of all the people who want to war. Now, <laughs> I don't know what that makes Jesus, but anyway... <laughs> It obviously makes Jesus a tyrant and a, and, and a dictator and a, what would you call it, an exterminator for God. But anyway, that's, uh, that's, there's some basic problems with logic there. But, but that is the teaching, is it not? The teaching that, that God will get, uh, and unfortunately there's a mixture between some religious faith and the Christian faith where some believe Jesus is God, of course, or a, or a facet of God or a tri, part of the triune God. And so a part of God is going to come down and destroy and smite everybody who basically wants to war so that there's no wars after that, and that's the teaching. That's, and that's in fact what many people want. Many people want somebody to come and say, get rid of all those Nasty people out there that want to go to war, get rid of the whole lot of them. Now, God doesn't want to get rid of them. God wants to redeem them. So getting rid of them doesn't redeem them. So already we can see there's some discrepancies in love here. The definition, God's definition of love, very, very different from the human definition of love. Right? Now, in your outline, I have listed five or six different points as to how God's definition of love differs from your own. That's one of them. A few of the others are that we, as humans, are in a huge amount of pain and suffering, are we not? Now, why doesn't God come and rescue us from this pain and suffering? There's got to be a reason. If, if God's a loving God and God's the pinnacle of love, and as I've said, if God's the highest source of love available to us and God doesn't come and do what we think love would do, then it means that what we think love would do, love wouldn't do. Doesn't it? Logically. So, so if we think about that for a moment, all of the different ways in which, you know, and there's other ways which you can see in your outline, I won't raise them all now, there's other ways in which God's definition of love, obviously, is completely the opposite to our own. We have a choice. 
If we're going to get educated in love, we're going to either accept the education of the world's version of love, but the only problem with that education is that it's not going to result in anything different than what we've already got. And the primary problem with that is we've got wars, suffering, you know, abuse going on all the time on this planet. Most people are not happy. Most relationships are not even happy, let's face it. Right? And this is the result of our definition of love. And so we go, well, we've got the choice. We either accept our definition of love and continue with that kind of life, or what do we do? We have to, we have to get some kind of change occurring so that our definition of love is being... We're willing to throw it out the window and actually accept a new definition of love. And do you know that's our major problem with the development of our will to love? We are not willing to throw away our own concept of love. We, we so jealously guard it and we hold on to it for grim death. I wouldn't say it's grim life because <laughs> we're not having much of a life as a result of it. And, and in fact, it's what I classified in the first century as the broad way leading to destruction. There was a narrow and cramped way that led to life, which was God's way of love. And very few are the ones finding it. Right? Because the majority of us want to continue being educated by the world. We, we accept the world's education and it, we make it a part of our own education. And as a result of it being a part of us now, we carry this education to our children, to our grandchildren, for generation after generation, expecting a different result but always obtaining the same result, which is the result we see in the planet today. We've got to do something different. Right. We've got to see, we've got to connect to the highest source of education about love in the universe if we're ever going to change this. So it's imperative, the, our imperative becomes to begin to see that we need to somehow change the way we access our life, we use our will, so that instead of accepting the education from the world around us in love and, and accepting their definition of love and accepting that that's the way everything needs to happen, we need to start to see that actually, no, God's way of love is the way of love that I must discover. And I must allow myself to be educated by God. So then the question becomes, of course, how do I do that? How, how do I get educated by God? And of course, that's what we want to talk about for the next 240 hours. <laughs> All right. Because we need to remove the impediments to getting educated by God, don't we? And we need to allow this education process to occur. So what we would like to do is, is firstly, in summary, highlight to you that the exercise of your will you need to see is of paramount concern to you. How you determine how you live the rest of your life needs to become a focus. And if you're ever going to resolve the age-old questions of the universe, along with ever having any happiness of any kind, you are going to need to change the way you live your life and therefore change the way you exercise your will. And you need to understand that the source of love, the source of an education, the best education in the universe is the person who created the universe. And if we can connect to this creator of the universe, we have the capacity to be educated. If we don't, then we will be blind people roaming around in the dark, getting to hold the hand of another blind person who also is roaming around in the dark, and both of us at some point are going to feel the results of that. We're going to trip over things in life, we're going to hurt ourselves, we're going to not understand why it's happening, because we cannot see anything. That's our alternative. 
That's the alternative the human race has engaged for tens of thousands of years. It's time to change it, don't you think? Yeah. So that's what I'd like to um, cover with you mostly this morning in this particular discussion. I want to develop my will in love. I want to learn that the highest source of love is God. So therefore, the paramount questions in my life and the, paramount, my, the use of my will, the most powerful use of my will, is to engage this relationship with God. And, and what we need to do is focus on how we engage this relationship with God and coming up to, and f to face some very basic questions about that particular relationship. So what we're going to do now is have a, have a if we can have a break of about, uh, it's going to be five or six minutes, because um, I've already gone four minutes over time, and, uh, and then we'll talk to you about how you feel about love today. <laughs>